Good afternoon. I call this meeting to order. As we're all well aware, the health care law requires businesses that employ 50 or more full-time or full-time equivalent employees to offer health insurance or pay an employer mandate penalty or tax. A critical issue is the definition of employee, but equally important is the issue of which and how many employees are attributed to the business. The answer may be simple for one business with a single owner. However, when an individual shares ownership of multiple entities or when a business has multiple owners, the answer is less clear. Today, we will examine the process of determining whether businesses are considered single or multiple entities under the health care law, which requires business owners to aggregate employees and could subject the business to the Obamacare employer mandate. According to the National Federation of Independent Business, 39% of small businesses with 20 or more employees own at least 10% of one or more other businesses. To determine if the threshold of 50 or more employees has been met in these situations, the health care law utilizes the Internal Revenue Service Code Controlled Group Business Aggregation Rules, which are complex and confusing even for most experts. Some experts have suggested that most small business owners could not interpret these rules without the guidance and related cost of a tax specialist. Despite the administration's promises that the health care law would help small businesses, each week seems to bring entrepreneurs more bad news, more costly regulations, more uncertainty, and less incentive to grow their business and create jobs. A recent U.S. Chamber of Commerce International Franchise Association survey found that 53 percent of small business owners believe the law will have a negative impact on their business. In our challenging economy, many small business owners are simply not hiring or are reducing worker hours to avoid the employer mandate. Thank you to this outstanding panel of witnesses who have taken time from their busy schedules to be here today. We do look forward to your testimony. I now yield uh, to Ranking Member Velasquez for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, small businesses are the backbone of our economy, but in the past, High health care costs and declining coverage have hindered small business owners and their employees. These factors have hampered our nation's entrepreneurial prowess and held back small businesses. In fact, the chairman mentioned NFIB, uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, they have conducted uh, surveys about small businesses, asking them what is the main issue that they are concerned about. They talk about the cost of health insurance to be able to provide. And in fact, 62% of small uh, businesses in this country provide no health insurance to their employees, their families, or themselves. So if anything, this law will enable small businesses to participate in the exchanges so that we have a larger pool. And in the process, we, we will bring premium costs down because that will provide the kind of leverage that will enable them to negotiate good premiums. But uh, the Affordable Care Act has changed the health care landscape for small firms. It has expanded coverage options, increased purchasing power, and gave consumers control over their own health care. Yet, as with any law of this magnitude, some fixes will need to be made along the way. It happens every day. That is what the legis legislative process is all about. We pass laws, we implement them, and we will, in any way that we understand makes need to, me to be fixed, we, that is what the mechanism of legislation is all about. That means listening to the feedback of those most affected and working together to ensure small firms secure quality, affordable health care. Today, we will do just that by hearing from witnesses about a complicated issue. The health care law includes an employer mandate 
that requires businesses with more than 50 full-time employees to provide health insurance. Its goal is to discourage employers from dropping coverage and leaving employees on their own to find insurance. While the enforcement of this rule has been delayed until 2015, many small employers must begin adapting now. This hearing will focus on a particular area of the law that many small firms may not be familiar with, the business aggregation rules. Traditionally, these rules have been used to treat separate business as a single employer for purposes of retirement plans. This is not new. We have used them. It's on the books when it comes to benefit plans. This tax rule were incorporated into proposed regulation to deter entities from splitting into smaller companies with the purpose of avoiding the employer mandate. The intent behind this regulation is admirable, but I remain concerned about how these very complex rules will impact small firms. What kind of outreach, what kind of resources will be there to assist small businesses for them to understand the rule and to abide by the rule? I'm sure it came as little surprise to many tax experts that these rules are being employed to determine business sizes. Unfortunately, for many family-owned businesses and franchise owners, these rules are not commonplace. For that reason, we must consider how the business aggregation rules impact many entrepreneur business models. Through some employers, though some small employers have already been applying this rule to comply with ERISA, other firms have a steep learning curve ahead of them. I hope our hearing today provides more information on just how many small employers currently navigate this rule and how many more will be newly affected. Our witnesses today will help walk us through these complicated standards and how best to educate owners of their nuances. With careful planning and proper outreach, small employers may avoid many pitfalls when complying with new obligations under the Affordable Care Act. I thank all the witnesses for being here, and I look forward to your insightful comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Our first witness today is Deborah Walker. Ms. Walker is a certified public accountant and the National Director of Compensation and Benefits for Cherry Beckert, LLP, in Tyson's Corner, Virginia. She advises small and large businesses on compensation, benefits, and employment tax matters. Welcome, and you have five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Collins, Ranking Member Velasquez, and members of the committee. Thank you for hosting this important hearing on the effect of the business aggregation rules on small business in applying the health care provisions. I'm Deborah Walker, a CPA with over 35 years of experience in the employee benefits area. To determine if the employer is subject to the shared responsibility rules of the Affordable Care Act, the business needs to determine who the employer is. And that determination is made by looking at related entities, related by common ownership, related by attribution, and also by services that the entities provide to each other. To make the determination, one needs to understand detailed ownership and the services that are provided to each other. My written submission describes these rules in excruciating detail, and I can assure you that no one would apply the rules in a complex situation without looking at the regulations. The rules, as mentioned, are used by the Affordable Care Act are the same rules used for determining whether qualified retirement plan benefits are provided on a non-discriminatory basis to a fair cross-section of employees. Those rules for retirement plans are voluntary, not mandatory. In addition, because we're looking at bright line tests, bright line tests offer the opportunity, as evidenced um, by the qualified plan rules, of ways to plan around them. In other words, for people to avoid the rules. In addition, because they're bright line tests, it often happens that the application doesn't make as much sense as it otherwise may. In the healthcare context, where we're looking at whether we have 50 employees or not, it's a complicated test 
for the few taxpayers that are nearing the 50 employee limit. Uh, one can expect that those employers nearing the 50 employee limit would in fact consider the increased health care cost in deciding whether to hire additional workers. It will lead to inefficient and unwarranted economic behavior. Many small employers, as mentioned, offer a retirement plan, a 401k safe harbor plan. They don't even need to apply these rules because they're not subject to the discrimination test due to the safe harbor. The small businesses could not do this without advice, and many of the advisors for small business are not familiar with the rules. So therefore, I, determine, I offer an alternative suggestion, and it's a suggestion that would be a facts and circumstances test. It would look to who is the individual that hires, that fires, that makes purchasing decisions, that sets prices, who operates that business on a day-to-day -day basis. And in that case, we don't have to worry about who is merely a passive investor and aggregate those entities. By focusing on control of day-to-day -day operations, the employer would be defined by the industry in which that employer individual operates, and it wouldn't affect the competitive position of the business. The opportunity to avoid the bright line test through planning would not be available, and the unwanted effects of a bright line test wouldn't exist. Now, this facts and circumstance idea is not new. We use it and have in the tax law for years, 30, 40 years, in determining whether somebody is an employee or independent contractor. And people tried uh, in the 80s to have certainty with determining whether somebody was an employee or independent contractor. And it was determined that there were too many varied situations between service providers and recipients. And it was too hard to draw a hard and fast bright line rule. And bright line rules would be circumvented. So what we have is a 20-factor test. The 20-factor test, there's not specific weight to any factor. In fact, the weight of the factors changes depending on the industry. And any advisor uh, and the IRS reviews the 20 factors, reviews the particular situation, and makes a judgment call. That the, uh, it's a facts and circumstances test subject to everybody's judgment, of course, subject to audit. Um, there's another place where we talk about separate lines of business. This is also in the qualified retirement plan area. A separate line of business is a portion of, of an employer identified by property and services that are provided to a customer. So we, this, the regulations define what is a separate line of business and it has to be organized individually. There has to be a distinct profit center and there can be no more than moderate overlap between employees and management. A rule such as that more of a facts and circumstances test may be more appropriate. Of course, as I mentioned, the determination is always subject to audit by the IRS. The rules could require a notice requirement. The rules could also have a procedure, such as they do for separate line of business and employee independent contractors, where, in fact, the two businesses could apply to the IRS for the IRS to make a determination. To summarize, the mechanical tests used for qualified plan rules are com overly complex and understood by only a limited number of tax professionals. A small business can't apply them without professional help. It's a small subset of professionals that deal with these rules, and these rules are only going to apply for businesses for a few years of their life cycle when they're close to the 50-employee test. For that reason, facts and circumstances to me, based on who controls day-to-day -day businesses, is a much uh, more logical rule. The statute or committee reports could list characteristics of management and control, and taxpayers would be able to make a judgment uh, as to whether they are, a, a, what constitutes the employer for purposes of these rules. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Ms. Walker. Uh, I'd like to yield to Ranking Member Velazquez to introduce our next witness. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Sibyl Borgardos. Ms. Borgardos is an attorney serving as the Chief 
Compliance Officer for HUB International Insurance Services. In this position, she provides compliance and consulting services regarding health plan and other employee benefits. Ms. Borgardos was previously chosen as one of the 100 leading women in insurance by business insurance and was selected as one of the 25 most influential business women by the St. Louis Business Journal. Welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Collins. Thank you, Ranking Member Velasquez. I am uh, honored and, and very uh, happy to be here to be able to give some comments and testimony on this very important issue. I want to have uh, an echo for what Ms. Walker said regarding some possible um, compromises or concessions towards small businesses. I think a control test would be a great, a great first step. Uh, as, as opposed to a bright line standard. I want everyone to keep in mind as we go through these types of discussions that the importance of the 50 employee rule and the control group rules, which can cause small businesses to be treated as one employer, has impacts not just on the basic issue of whether the employer will be subject to the law as a whole. It has huge implications also for the practical compliance under the rules. I want to address specifically today the issues of complexity, also the issues of awareness, and then finally confusion. And I think the issue of complexity, uh, as, you, as you read through the rules, very quickly you begin to learn, uh, as you've seen from the, the written testimony and comments, that these are very complex rules. It definitely requires a tax advisor or corporate planner to assist an, employee, an employer in determining whether they have a control group. As to the awareness, the level of awareness is low. If an employer has voluntarily decided to create a retirement plan, yes, they've, they've generally addressed these issues. But for employers that, that are uh, made up of various small groups, they've likely not done this if they've not put in place a retirement plan. And while it is true that insurance carriers ask questions about the employer's size, they do so not so much to do an analysis. It is not an analysis. They're asking questions about size so that they can put into their programs how COBRA should be administered if it does apply, whether Medicare secondary payer rules apply, and other technical issues like that. But it is not an analysis of the control group. They're also asking that question so they can determine whether they will issue a small group or large group policy. We're already seeing confusion around that issue. For example, uh, just this week I received an email regarding an employer, small employer in California, and they were unable to get a small employer policy because they were considered to be part of a larger control group by the insurance carrier. The insurance carrier in California said they would not issue that policy because it would be discriminatory. However, that same control group had a small employer in Arizona. That small employer in Arizona was able to get the policy. For the employees in California, very low paid employees, they're now put into a very expensive PPO and they cannot afford it. It's $1,300 a month. So we have seen, we have seen quite a, a bit of uh, low awareness around this issue, even among not just small employers but large employers. They say uh, many times, I wasn't aware of this, um, and we do get comments that are uh, very incredulous that this would even be the case. Uh, in terms of uh, some of the additional confusion, there are uh, myths around association plans. Unless you have stickiness within a group, it is difficult to put uh, unrelated or even fairly close re closely related employers together. Some insurance carriers will not write them, even though they technically would be a control group for U.S. tax purposes. So keep that in mind. Part of the problem is the practical uh, access to the insurance coverage, which the law unfortunately does not guarantee for the small employers. Are there planning opportunities? Yes. Uh, do we see smaller employers trying to uh, use those to avoid compliance with the law? Not yet. And I think part of the lack of awareness is also a little bit of, uh, of a reaction to the delays that have occurred. The employers believe that there have been uh, delays and that those delays will continue. Uh, for smaller businesses, uh, there is a sentiment that the rules for the large employers were delayed, which they were until 2015. However, for the smaller businesses, they've already felt, the, uh, many of them, the brunt of the very expensive renewals this year. Of our clients that were offered an early renewal option to renew their policy this December, 
and to delay the cost impacts of health reform, invariably they have taken that offer if the carrier has extended it. Uh, so they have, uh, have basically kicked the issue down the road for another year, so to speak, and also the cost impacts. We'll hear more about that next fall, additional policy cancellations and increases. We are seeing some premium increases of 100 percent for smaller employers. So it's, uh, it's, it's a matter of the law providing access to coverage with no preexisting conditions, but it is not uh, by any means affordable, even for the small businesses. The small businesses are also different. If they're part of a control group, that does not mean there's actual control or authority or even cooperation among the various owners. Uh, there is no, generally no central payroll system, no central HR person. They may handle that function at various locations, but not centrally. Uh, commonly, there are um, situations where the employers simply don't have a common point person. Now, of course, they could, could appoint someone, but creating common systems to determine whether the employer is, is 50 employees or more, and then also consistency across the group for payroll purposes is uh, very difficult. I want to also touch quickly on participation requirements that insurance carriers have in the small group marketplace. Uh, the rules under the federal law do allow participation requirement of 70 percent. The insurance carrier can require that percentage of the employees to elect the coverage. Alternatively, many carriers require the employer to pay a significant percentage of the premium for employee only, sometimes 100 percent of the cost. So the concept that the employer is only going to pay uh, for the coverage based on the 9.5 percent rule is not the case, not for small employers and not for large employers. Uh, the employers are paying significantly more, especially because of the fact that they cannot know household income. The discrimination rules, which have yet to be issued, are a continuing concern. Uh, just for information, the senior counsel for the Treasury Department indicated to me that they cannot enforce those rules. That's what we've experienced in actual practice. Even when there is an audit, they ask to see uh, the testing, check it off their list, and they're done with the issue. They can't enforce the current rules for self-funded plans. It will be extremely difficult for them to do so for small insured plans and very difficult for the employers to be able to coordinate a non-discriminatory program ac across various companies in different industries in different states uh, quite commonly. Automatic enrollment, if the group should happen to be above 200, will be another serious issue whenever that rule does eventually take effect. And then finally, MIWA issues. Uh, commonly held, commonly controlled groups for federal tax purposes may not be sufficiently related for either carrier purposes, they may not issue the policy, or the states may consider those groups to be an illegal MIWA under state law, uh, even though it's not being formed as a self-funded plan to do anything to avoid state rules. And it would require uh, licensing as an insurance carrier for those groups if they would try to self-fund and then also capitalization as a carrier and regulation as a carrier. So very onerous. Um, just in summary, I think there are many issues that are affecting the smaller employers' awareness, complexity of the rules, certainly, but I think the issues around confusion and the fear uh, of the smaller employers as to what impacts they will feel from the law and what they should do now with the uncertainty without regulations. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Uh, Bogardas. Our next witness is Ellis Winstanley. Uh, Ellis is the Chief Executive Officer of Trade Logic Corporation in Austin, Texas. With several of his family members, Mr. Winstanley owns a number of businesses, including restaurants, a catering company, a software company, and a promotional products company. Welcome. Chairman Collins. Ranking Member Velasquez and members of the House Committee on Small Business, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the effects of the business aggregation rules included in the health care law on small businesses like ours. My name is Ellis Wynn Stanley. I'm the CEO of Trade Logic Corporation. I own a variety of small businesses in Austin, Texas, with my twin brother, parents, and other partners. I'm honored to share the perspective of our companies, especially our restaurants. On behalf of the National Restaurant Association, the leading trade organization for the restaurant and food service industry. I'm a business executive with a successful track record of starting up, turning around, and growing businesses in the hospitality, construction, software, printing and promotional products, and apparel industries. My brother and I are entrepreneurs who got started in business while we were students at the University of Texas. We are known for rescuing local historic restaurant brands and turning them around to maintain their place in the community as, as uh, contributors and job creators. 
Currently, we own eight restaurants with our partners, which I oversee day to day on a day to day basis. We are also partnered with our parents in two construction and three printing and promotional products, small businesses. In addition, we own software development companies, one of which is Trade Logic Corporation, which also serves as our management company. The health care law presents compliance challenges for all of our small businesses, but particularly for the restaurant and food service operations due to the unique characteristics of our workforce. It's difficult for many restaurants, especially small businesses, to determine how lo the law impacts us and what we must do to comply. The employer aggregation rules present a, a significant complication to our business. It may sim seem like a simple thing to do, but due to the aggregation rules and the structure of many restaurant companies, determining the employer is more complicated than many may expect. Austin, Texas, like many other cities around the country, has a rapidly developing restaurant community, and we, like most of the operators we know, participate in multiple restaurant entities with various partners, often with family members. Though we consider each operation to be a small business, many of us are discovering that for the purpose of the health care law, all of the businesses must be considered one employer due to the aggregation rule. This threatens to stunt the development of restaurants in our community. The application of these aggregation rules is already having an impact on small businesses, consuming valuable time and resources as businesses attempt to decipher the law's effect on them. Most of our small businesses each have less than 50 full-time equivalent employees and independently would not be considered applicable large employers. Two are highly seasonal businesses and may not be considered large depending on the calendar month and uncontrollable factors such as whether or not our legislature is in session, the performance of UT sports, and academic calendars related to the surrounding universities. Based on my understanding of the aggregation rules, I believe we will be considered as one employer under the law, thus an, applic thus an applicable large employer. The effect of this is that the cost of doing business for each of our companies will go up. Restaurants operate on thin margins, already forcing operators to manage labor costs very closely to remain viable. Austin, Texas remains one of the strongest economies in the country, but since the recession, we have regularly tightened our belts to manage rising costs, and we are very much still feeling the impact, including double-digit health insurance premium increases, even since the law was passed. This puts pressure on our team, our vendors, our pricing, and in the end, our, con our customers. I see the cost associated with the way the health care law has been implemented as adding significantly to that pressure. In addition to the aggregation rules, there are several other sections of the law that impact restaurant operations and similar small businesses. While the increasing cost of offering coverage remains a major concern, I'm also very concerned about the administrative demands that compliance with this law will impose on our businesses. The restaurant and food service industry attracts people seeking a flexible work environment. Whether they're students, between careers, or just looking for a second job to make ends meet, there is significant movement in and out of the industry and between employers. Given the short-term nature of individual employment, the administrative burden of educating and processing enrollments and declinations could prove almost as expensive as the coverage itself. Restaurants cannot absorb this cost, and ultimately the cost will be borne by the public as a whole. The implementation also threatens the safe haven of the flexible and work environment for those who depend on it. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify before you today regarding the health care law and its effects on the, big, on the, and the effects of the business aggregation rules on small businesses like ours. Mm. I'm both proud and grateful for the responsibility of serving my community in Austin, Texas, creating jobs, boosting the economy, and serving our customers. We are committed to working with Congress to find solutions that foster growth and truly benefit the communities we serve. Thank you, Mr. Winstanley. Our final witness is Donna Baker. Ms. Baker is a certified public accountant in Adrian, Michigan. She holds an MBA from Michigan State University and a BA in accounting from Siena Heights University. Welcome. There you go. Thank you, Chairman Collins and Ranking Member um, Velasquez and members of the committee. It is really an honor to be here to testify on this subject. Um, I am Donna Baker, a CPA. I've been a CPA for 25 years, and I have owned my own accounting firm for the last 13 years. Uh, I live in practice in Lenawee County, Michigan, which is a very small rural area. On top of owning my own CPA firm, I also own a small payroll company. Um, I have invested in a retail store, and my husband, Kim, which is also with me here today, is a partner in a family dairy farm. Um, as you've already heard, 
the business aggregation rules require any group of companies under common control to be treated as a single employer. The primary key in determining which company should be combined, combined is either direct or attributed ownership or affiliated service, but not operational control. These rules may cause unrelated businesses held by family members or trusts to be aggregated. Companies within a control group do not need to have the same management or even be in the same industry. Also, um, the business aggregation rules are very complicated, as you've heard, and are rarely applicable to small businesses. Therefore, they're unfamiliar to both small businesses and small business advisors. I have um, had many webinars and training on the ACA rules, and most of the materials will mention that the controlled group rules apply, but do not cover the specific of these rules. And unfortunately, I think many business advisors that deal with just primarily small businesses assume that, you know, controlled groups means hand on, hands-on control instead of the actual emphasis of direct or attributed ownership. I have two examples um, of applying these control groups to two businesses. One is my own personal business. Um, like I said, I own 100% of a very small CPA firm that I also manage, along with the payroll company that I manage. And um, I have invested in a retail store. However, that is an investment. I do not manage that or operate that on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then, of course, my husband's farm. Um, he is a partner with his brother in the dairy farm. I have no management responsibilities. I do not make decisions for that company. Um, but my name is on some of the land, and I do provide some bookkeeping services. So based on the business aggregation rules, we would have to combine all four of those entities. We are not quite close to 50 employees yet, but close, and the payroll company is new and very quickly growing. My second example is one of my clients. I have an elderly woman that owns 100% of two local restaurants, and her son manages and controls all of the business decisions in those two restaurants. She recently um, provided the capital for a nephew to open a restaurant in Florida in which the restaurant in Florida, the nephew, um, manages and makes all the business decisions for that restaurant. Under the current business aggregation rules, those three entities would be combined and they would exceed the 50 full-time equivalents and require them to provide the minimal, minimum essential health insurance benefits. So those two examples illustrate how the control group rules will aggregate businesses that are not directly owned by the same person. They do not have the same management are not in the same industry and may not even be in the same state. Therefore, the implications of requiring small businesses to use these aggregation rules could create several negative effects. It could hinder growth and discourage owners from hiring new employees. It can create that, that environment where the owners try to manipulate their ownership percentages or minimize their employees to, and keep them within the 30 hours. It could discourage small business owners from investing in other businesses, and it could require them to provide health insurance benefits in industries where it's not typically the norm, and the additional costs could create um, it difficult for them to compete in those industries. Lastly, I'd like to mention the increased cost of my own plan. I do provide basic health insurance for my uh, people in my accounting firm and my payroll company. This policy has been canceled, and the closest policy, I've been quoted a 40 to 44 percent increase that would have reduced benefits. It would have higher co-pays and, and higher maximum out-of-pocket expenses. So these increased costs would be very difficult to absorb. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Baker. Uh, we'll now enter uh, kind of a questioning period, and I guess I'd like to start by just uh, stating the obvious. The hearings like this that we're having today give us all an opportunity to obtain testimony on the record that will highlight the consequences, intended and unintended, of various laws and regulations. And it's very helpful then, as Ms. Velazquez said, as we move down the road and we look at potential changes uh, that we need. And again, to state the obvious, uh, we all need and want more jobs in the economy. Uh, the economy is, is 
are kind of languishing today, and uh, more jobs is what everything's about, getting the unemployment down and uh, increasing payroll across the country to drive the economy. Will you yield? Certainly. So I will join you in supporting legislation uh, that passing the jobs uh, bill that we uh, have uh, for so long. So what we need is to pass legislation to create jobs, and we're just waiting for the leadership to do so. I can appreciate that. It is jobs. We may disagree, though, on what stimulates jobs. I know myself, I believe in lower taxes, less regulation, less government interference, and certainly we'll have some other questions today to indicate the uh, impact of the ACA. Uh, what I heard today, though, and again, it's in the, I'm a small business guy. We have the mantra, grow or die. And if you're not growing, uh, you're not doing what you should do as an entrepreneur. Uh, but growth requires capital accounts receivable, inventory, et cetera, et cetera. And any and all dollars wasted on regulatory burdens, such as the business aggregation rule and hiring a tax expert, is in fact a dollar that's not available to invest in growth. So I, I guess briefly, uh, we have a lot of members to ask questions, but just to reconfirm, I think I heard it in your testimony, uh, but we'd like to go down the line, starting with Ms. Walker, and just ask you if you think uh, this business aggregation rule uh, is, as it's currently written, uh, would have a negative impact on jobs and the economy, hindering job creation and economic growth, and therefore should be altered. I think any time that you have a bright line test, it's going to hinder people that don't want to cross the bright line test. And that, in this case, is going to hinder hiring, hinder um, uh, expansion, and uh, the the grow or die it's we're, they're just going to choose to stop growth and perhaps move over to other forms of business uh, other ownership um, so yes thank you uh, Ms. Bogardis yes Mr. Chairman the um, provisions definitely do hinder job growth and they hinder strong job growth and by that I mean that the jobs that could be created in the future would instead be part-time jobs. That's, uh, of course, advisors on this topic have their own bag of tricks, and it is definitely possible to stay outside of compliance with respect to each individual employee if you can keep that individual in a part-time position. Full-time jobs are absolutely necessary. You cannot serve two masters. It's hard to have uh, coordination just on the part of the employee, much less between two separate employers. So uh, a st strong job growth is necessary. And of course, there are other issues involved as well. But I, I agree that the funds that are spent to an analyze the issue and then also to comply are uh, extremely high. And it's not just the initial cost. It's the participation every single year in the premium payment. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Winstanley? Yes, I think you're. I think what we're seeing now is less people have insurance than than have had insurance. I've seen it, the reverse effect of what we're hoping to achieve here. And I think we've also, uh, in the restaurant industry specifically, hear a lot of talk about people getting pushed below 30 hours a week, and that being the, the reaction. You see that being tried around the country, and I think that's extremely negative for the industry. I think that's negative for the employees. I think that at the long term, that's uh, while some groups I'm think feel that that's their only option, but I think in the long run that's not healthy for our economy. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Baker. Yes, I do. Um, as in the testimony, I think there's a lot of concerns with that. Um, but I'm also concerned with those that have the true entrepreneurial spirit to be discouraged from investing in more small businesses and expanding in other areas. And that would definitely hinder uh, one more quick question, and then I'll uh, yield to uh, uh, Ms. Velasquez. Kind of a yes-no. Uh, you know, we're focused today on the complex business aggregation rules, but we're talking about other issues, and certainly Mr. Wynn Stanley's talked about the impact and the employees getting their hours cut and the like to get them under the 30-hour the, uh, rule. Uh, so, and again, as we look and try to message some changes that, that could be made, uh, I'd first like to ask each of you if you think, in your opinion, the 30-hour definition of full-time should be increased back to 40 hours. Ms. Walker. 
yes, it will prevent the people from ratcheting down workers to 30 hours and leave them at 40. Yeah. Ms. Bogardis? Yes. Okay. Mr. Wynn Stanley? Yes, I do. Ms. Baker? Yes, absolutely. Very succinct. And now uh, the other question, though, we talk a lot about the 50, and there's a lot of companies in that 40-plus, going to 50, wanting to go to 75, and under Obamacare, this arbitrary selection of 50, now defining a large corporation, uh, uh, doesn't fit with the entrepreneurial spirit. So in the same, you know, what do you think, yes or no, do you think we should increase beyond 50 the number of FTEs that would, would trigger the Affordable Care Act? I don't know if it's 100 or 150, but do you believe the 50 is too low and stifles job creation and therefore we as Congress should increase it to a number higher than 50? I think the, the bright line test of a certain number of people is the wrong test. You need a facts and circumstances test on who has day-to-day uh, -day control. Uh, if you increase it to 50, then the same thing that happens at beyond 50, that happens at 50 will happen beyond 50, whether it's 75, 150, 200, or 500. Yeah, Ms. Bogardis. As with the 30-hour rule, I would agree that increasing the number above 50 would alleviate uh, a number of the issues. But as with the 30-hour rule, it's a legislative fix. There would have to be the change to the statute itself. Understood. Right. Mr. Um, Wynn Stanley. I think that the challenge comes in that every industry can't be put in the same box. I think in the evaluation of really any any organization that tries to encapsulate multiple industries, there's always different criteria for different industries. And I think looking at an industry with a somewhat mobile workforce or by general definition a short-term workforce, uh, I think the costs are going to be significantly higher for the same number of employees, uh, same number of FTEs than it would be with with a longer term workforce. So I, I, I don't, I, yes, I think it should be higher, but I don't think it can be the same number for every industry. Okay, thank you. Ms. Baker. Uh, yes, I think that would definitely help, but then I, you know, support what has previously been said. A facts and circumstance would make a whole lot more um, sense when it comes to defining control. And then when you do have something that crosses different industries, it is adding additional complications. So thank you. Uh, thank you all. I'll, I'll yield to uh, Ranking Men Member Velasquez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just would like to uh, call the attention for the members of the committee to the hearing that we conducted here in this committee on October 9th, the effect of the law and definition of full-time employee and small businesses. And uh, one of the expert witnesses was Dean Baker, uh, the executive director for the Center for Economic and Policy Research, who conducted uh, analyzed data right after we passed uh, the Affordable Care Act and where small businesses were expecting uh, the employer mandate to go into effect. And since then, he didn't find any data that show that small businesses were not hiring uh, employees or or increasing the 30 hours because of the small, when the Affordable Care Act was in effect and when people were expecting the uh, employer mandate to go into effect. So uh, the Federal Reserve from San Francisco conducted another uh, uh, research demonstrating that it has not had any effect. But like any law, we will continue to monitor and make the fixes that are necessary. My question to the panel of witnesses. Uh, the business aggregation rules are meant to prevent skirting the law. Uh, in your opinion, what is the correct balance between preventing abuses and protecting closely held businesses from potential penalties? Ms. Walker. I think any time that you have a bright line test, mm -hmm. you're going to end up with abuses because people will walk right up to that bright line and not cross it. So what you have to do is come back and put it into a facts and circumstances test where you apply judgment, I apply judgment, the IRS applies judgment, and we have a, each person decides based on the facts and circumstances in that situation 
whether there should be an aggregation, whether it truly operates as an employer. So do you consider that uh, a final regulation should incorporate uh, a fact and circumstances test? Yes. Okay. That would be a statutory change, however. Ms. Bogardos. Uh, I agree with Ms. Walker that the facts and circumstances test is a much better standard, mm -hmm. um, again, requiring a legislative change. And that I will think, create more jobs? I, I think it would, and I think also serious consideration should be given to changing the threshold mm -hmm. from 50 to uh, perhaps 250 and look at it on an industry basis instead, or perhaps blend the two. Uh, there are some uh, precedents for using 250, such as the W-2 payroll reporting rule. Sure, I think uh, I think when you look at the original context that the controlled group provision was put together per the IRS, uh, it was put out there to stimulate the use of corporations and, and companies growing, and I think that using the way it's being implemented now is having the alternate effect. I think there could be, I think what businesses need is clarity around, uh, around what the rules are and, and they, need some, they need some rules that they can yeah. reasonably work with based on the industry they're in. And I, then I think that job growth will loosen Ms. up. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Baker, I, I just would like to ask you another question. Uh, when it comes for uh, contracting programs, uh, in the federal government, or maybe Ms. Borgardos, uh, you might be willing to answer this question. A business must meet not only ownership by holding a majority of shares, but also demonstrate active control over business operation, and you described that mm -hmm. uh, in your testimony. Mm -hmm. Yet, for purposes of the ACA and business aggregation rules, only common ownership is considered. Which standard, in your opinion, is a better indicator of ownership. Ms. Baker. Or I'm not sure I really got that, but um, to me it would be control over the entity, the the day-to-day -day operations, mm -hmm. the decision-making, not just investment or, um, you know, so the day-to-day -day operations, which supports the facts and circumstance um, that they've been discussing here. Ms. Bogardos. I would agree, actual control and the facts and circumstances of the day-to-day -day operations, which is also necessary, absolutely necessary for compliance. And as I said before, the small businesses don't have centralized systems, payroll, HR. Thank you. Um, I will make other questions, but I know that other members would like to make. Uh, thank you. At this point, I'd like to yield uh, five minutes to uh, Representative Tipton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think I'd like to start out uh, with Mr. Weinstanley when you're talking about the variety of businesses you have. Uh, do you file separate tax returns? Yes, they all file separate tax returns. Well, why doesn't uh, are you allowed if you have a loss on uh, your uh, Lodge Tech business, your your small software business versus your restaurant? Can you write that loss off against your restaurant? No, they're separate. Well, what happened to business aggregation? Right. The, uh, there's a significant administrative burden that goes with running the multiple entities okay. separately, and there's value to doing so. So effectively what we're seeing through this administration is a policy to be able to force you uh, to be able to provide that health care. Has that impacted your ability to be able to create jobs? Yes. You're, li you're living in the real world. Uh, you know, we just heard comment that there is no data. Uh, I'll quote that again, that there is no data that small businesses are not hiring as a result of the implementation of the President's Affordable Health Care Act. No effect on job hiring. Is that your experience? No, it's not. Anyone I, else care to comment? No, it's not. I see it in small businesses and large businesses. So businesses aren't hiring because of the Affordable Care Act? I believe it's draining resources from the companies that would otherwise be going to use, use to grow the businesses. Uh, very, very interesting because uh, we aren't dealing with theoretical data. Uh, we're dealing with real life experiences. I appreciate that testimony. Uh, I do. I come from rural Colorado. I'm a small business guy. Uh, do you have any experience, and perhaps uh, the CPAs on the panel can address this the best? 
Are you seeing insurance cost differences between businesses in rural areas versus urban areas? And what I can speak to is in the state of Colorado, if you punch in a rural zip code uh, for your health care insurance, you are paying a 65 percent premium compared to people that are living in urban Colorado. Are you seeing those same sorts of circumstances? I'm sorry. I'm going to have to pass that to the insurance person. <laughs> I, I can address that. Uh, that is happening, and it, it does happen because there's less competition. There are fewer facilities in the rural areas, and they can charge what they want to charge because that's the only hospital, the only emergency room in but some since cases. Since you have a little bit of experience with this, uh, is it a little more typical in these rural areas to see a lower income than we do in, in urban America? Yes, sir. It is. Uh, you know, we hear a lot of talk here in Washington coming out of this administration about income inequality. Uh, but I'm just hearing testimony that the administration, through its policies, are forcing you to cut the incomes of people by reducing their hours. We're hearing that people that live now in rural America who earn less are going to be paying more for what is now law that you must obey and buy insurance. Is that correct? Uh, the simple answer is yes. simple answer is yes. So... Effectively, what we're seeing is a system that uh, is not affordable, and uh, we can certainly get into the accessibility issues as well. But uh, going back to the aggregation rules, and uh, we're specifically trying to be able to address on this, uh, can anyone on the panel give me a small business guy? I just want to be able to produce my product, to be able to sell, to be able to provide for my family. Can you give me two sentences to be able to define the aggregation rule? Can anyone? A parent subsidiary group where you own 80% of a chain of corporations, a brother-sister corporation where the same five or fewer operate, own 50%, and in conjunction, 80%, and then the affiliated service group rules. Those rules don't necessarily have ownership, but if I provide management services to another business, that will be aggregated. Yeah, as a small business guy, I'd have to tell you, you're a CPA. That's about as clear as mud, <laughs> uh, Timmy, uh, to, to really to be able to understand that. Uh, how much, you know, when it, we, we've had abundant testimony on this uh, committee. Uh, the rules and regulations are one of the, and this is another one that we're talking about today, are killing jobs in America, killing job hiring prospects in America today when we need to be able to hire people. Uh, how much more is this going to cost small businesses like Mr. Wine Stanley's who are working on a narrow profit margin just to be able to comply with another government mandate? Any idea? Anytime you look at these rules in a situation as complicated as his with different ownership, you're going to have to sit down with a chart. When he cha transfers ownership to children, to other people, you're going to have to go through the chart. You're going to have to ask him who does the management for his different businesses, does the software company, in fact, do some payroll for the restaurants, those types of questions. And then you're going to put it all together. Once you reach 50 people, you'll have to know, he'll have to comply with the rules, and then he knows which companies in that pot he has to provide minimum essential coverage to the workers for. A lot of money. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You yield back. Uh, thank you. At this point, I'd uh, like to yield five minutes to Representative Ming. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Velasquez. Uh, I had a question. I think it was Mr. Wynn Stanley who testified, if I heard correctly, that you believe that fewer people have health insurance now. I believe that fewer people are accepting health insurance now that is available to them. Um, I'm just curious. I know that there are a lot of good employers out there, like you, Ms. Baker, who have always provided health insurance to your employees. Uh, I represent a district in Queens, New York City, where a lot of employers have not always done the right thing, like you, Ms. Baker, and have not provided health insurance to their employees and have taken advantage of many employees around the country who don't speak English and are not familiar with rules. Um, Statistics have shown that on Sunday and Monday alone, 29,000 people signed up for the new health care law just on the website in two days. And I was just wondering, you know, what advice could you have given or would you give to a lot of these employees or small business employers uh, who have not provided insurance in the past? 
and anyone can answer. Sure. I mean, so we like to consider ourselves a good employer, and we have provided insurance in the past. The, the nature of it is that the cost of insurance has risen drastically in the last few years, and most of the young people who are healthy simply drop off the plan, which makes the cost go up even more. And so we've got a situation where people aren't willing to pay for the insurance, despite the fact that we're continuing to increase our contribution, and it's become it's become a situation where I've got to believe with. I only know from my own experiences what what we're dealing with, but I've got to believe that there's a lot of other small businesses around the country that have experienced the exact same thing. And I think if you multiply all those, that the net loss is significant. Would the gentle lady yield? Uh, I just would like to relate the fact that in Massachusetts, when they passed the law and implemented it. Uh, the target of the young people uh, were not signing on, and then later on they did enroll into the Health Affordable Care Act. So we believe that that type of trend that we saw in Massachusetts will be seen throughout the country. Can I answer yours? Okay. You know, so for my own personal situation, I'm in one of the rural areas with very high health insurance um, and low, lower income. Our, our county has about 99,000 as a population with an average household income of middle 40,000. So as I struggle to provide more health insurance and they aggregate my, the businesses to make it, you know, if I can stay under that 50, I will. I mean, it'll be extremely expensive for me. And in the meantime, to absorb a 40 to 44 percent health insurance increase, it would be much easier for me to put my kit, my employees back out on the exchange. It's a lot cheaper for them to provide that than for me to absorb that additional cost within my small profit margins um, anyway. So thank you. I, I would just uh, comment that if the additional cost of adding each employee would be approximately $4,000 to provide insurance to that individual at an affordable rate, it may be a uh, smaller figure in, in some places, higher in others. Uh, that does stunt the job growth. I will say that the, uh, the law itself is having an impact on, on the cost, and we are seeing people not enroll in the coverage that maybe in the past they would have enrolled in because the costs are just higher. And we do see, uh, and traditionally have seen, young individuals not enroll in the coverage even if it costs them $20 a pay period and it's a matter of individual choice. They are looking at the coverage and they are saying, I would rather have the money. And in the bigger picture, in the context of wages, if people would rather have the money, the Affordable Care Act takes that off the table if they have to be offered the insurance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to yield uh, five minutes to Representative Luke Meyer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, one of the things that I think we are seeing and you've discussed today is, is the problem with uh, companies trying to deal with this. Uh, I know there was a, an economist in committee here uh, recently, and they had done a small business survey. And 76% of the businesses that were surveyed say they were not going to hire in the next six months. And I think, you know, you've, Ms. Ms. Walker, you have uh, mentioned in your testimony here something uh, like not hiring workers or limiting work, working hours. Uh, have you seen this already with your practice that businesses are starting to limit their hours? And can you give me an idea of the number of businesses you're talking about? What I've, se what I've seen is that businesses tend to hire new workers at less than 30 hours. So when we have to expand, we're going to expand on a part-time basis. Okay. One, of, one of the other things I saw in a statistic yesterday for a, a slide presentation, if you go back two years, there were six full-time workers hired for every one, wor one part-time worker. That has flipped now in such that it's one full-time worker is hired for every four part-time workers, and those are DOL statistics. Thank you for that. Um, Ms. Uh, Bogardis, you, <clears throat> in your comments a while ago, you said that there, if I got this right, correct me if I'm wrong here, you made the comment that uh, your company 
doesn't write some groups because they may not be a related business. It, it, so in other words, you're not sure if they would fall under this rule or not. So as a result, you back away from doing that. Is, uh, did I understand that correctly? Um, actually, we're an insurance consulting and brokerage firm. Okay, well, so we see we see the insurance carriers doing that and refusing to write certain groups. And some of it may be the confusion among the carriers, but they're still uh, exercising their leeway when they can to refuse to write a policy. So even though they may technically, if, if they did the research and they dotted their I's across their T's, may actually qualify, just, just the unintended consequence, just the the, the uh, concern about the they may be in noncompliance is enough to back them away from that. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. It it may be a smaller um, a smaller entity, a smaller subsidiary in one state, mm -hmm. uh, without the headquarters location, and so it could not be the location or situs for the insurance contract as a whole, and they back away from it. Now you work with this every day. Uh, are all the rules promulgated now on the president's health care law? Uh, no, sir, they are not. The, the, uh, we the, have to go yet. The, the, rules, the rules we have currently on, uh, on the very important issues of, of player pay, uh, the employer mandate, were issued in early January last year. Um, we have <clears throat> a, a lack of final guidance, a lack of guidance on very industry and employee-specific issues. Um, there are impacts and un unintended consequences of the rules that have already been in issued that need to be fixed and resolved. And we do not know basic information such as whether we will get transition relief for uh, particular situations such, such as uh, counting the employees for purposes of 2015. Uh, we're less than a month away from the calendar year that is most at issue 2014 starting January 1st and an employer needs to know. So we're lacking uh, guidance. We're kind of operating in an area of this is what we know today, which is the case. How can you, how can you help that company plan with the uncertainty that just sort of hangs over them with regards to not the rules aren't promulgated yet as well as don't know the unintended consequences of what may or may not happen here? We like to, to address that with a three to five year strategy and we always have a plan B. If they change the rules in this manner, then we'll go this direction. But we advise, um, we do have some small business clients, but we advise uh, many, many large employers. And I, I know that not every small employer has access to advisors with the level of sophistication that we would bring. Mr. Winstanley, thank you for being here today. It's always great to have uh, someone who deals with this on a daily basis. Ms. Baker, you as well, uh, because you give us the real-life experience of how the consequences, unintended consequences of, the, of stuff that goes on here in Washington affects real people in the real world. Um, <clears throat> how much time and how much money do you spend on compliance with this health care law, Mr. Winstanley? It has been a very significant distraction from our business over the last couple years. Um, especially as we try to ascertain where it's going to go and which where things are going to land. Uh, our administrative, uh, some of the folks that help with our administrative stuff have spent a lot of time. I've spent a lot of time on it. Um, some of my, you know, it takes a lot of our energy. Ms. Baker. I've been flooded with questions and phone calls over the last year with my clients. Um, just, you know, there's a, just a lot of confusion, wondering if, you know, they have to start providing the health insurance, when, when, when would it be mandated, what do they have to do. So, I mean, I, I guess I've not tracked the time specifically, but it has definitely been a burden on my practice to try to answer all the questions that are out there. And that cost and all those man hours are all borne by your business, and therefore that's not making you any money. Is Absolutely. It? Yeah. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, although they've called votes, we do have time for another question or two. So at this point, I'll yield uh, five minutes to Representative Hahn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member of Alaska, for holding this hearing. And, you know, it would be nice to hold these hearings with the thought that if we did hear uh, some unintended consequences that impact our small business, that we had the belief uh, that our friends on the other side would actually like to work on fixing uh, some of these problems. I get frustrated in these hearings because I know uh, the main purpose is just to have more bad stuff to talk about uh, and to uh, attack the Affordable Care Act. I, I would love for this 
committee to actually work on some fixes. And I think we even heard uh, some uh, some offers of compromises that might make it better. But I'll tell you, uh, you know, that's not going to happen. Uh, we don't have partners on the other side that actually uh, want to look at this law, how it does impact your businesses, and take any time or effort to fix it. We're more than willing uh, to work with our friends on the other side to uh, fix things that maybe nobody thought about or that do have unintended consequences because being members of the small business committee we love our small businesses we're for our small businesses uh this is one of the committees that uh i enjoy when i go back home to my district in los angeles is, is talking to my small businesses and finding out what we can do uh here to help them out so it, it's frustrating uh to know that there is no intention uh, on the other side, all the testimony you give, uh, nobody is willing to work with uh, us to try to fix this law. Having said that, um, you know, uh, I'll ask that to uh, Ms. Bogardis. So these business aggregation rules already apply to many aspects of business law, like ERISA and COBRA. Uh, so I know some of these small businesses found it a surprise possibly that they it also uh, included their compliance as it related to the Affordable Care Act. So maybe you can explain to us why it came as a surprise when, when these aggregation rules already existed and small businesses were in compliance in other areas. And maybe um, there are some small businesses that are having to come in uh, contact or in compliance with uh, these aggregation laws for the first time, and maybe uh, let us know why why it was a surprise, and maybe two, uh, what kinds of small businesses are experiencing this for the first time? What, what kinds of businesses uh, that maybe never had to comply with with this law before, even in other areas? Yes, Representative Hahn, thank you. Uh, the the answer to that is that while these rules have been in effect for quite some time, they affect ERISA, COBRA, uh, Medicare secondary, and a number of technical issues, including retirement plans. If a business has not offered a retirement plan and has not offered a health plan, then the analysis simply has not been done. Even if the small business has offered a health plan, again, there's not been the analysis. The insurance carrier says, how many employees do you have? The small business owner answers for the group that he's covering. There's not an analysis. No one has the um, ability, time, or authority to sit down from the insurance carrier and work with that employer to determine its size in particular over the entire control group. And that's just simply not done. The carrier has no obligation uh, nor consideration for whether the rest of the control group is addressed or not. Uh, so it does come as quite a surprise. I, th I think the difference is that the mandate, it's a, uh, this is a mandate, whereas where it's providing health insurance, I can provide health insurance to just some of my workers and not others. So it's all been voluntary before. And what, will, what criteria will you use to decide which workers will get uh, health insurance? It's often dri driven it's by job retention? It's often driven by the industry. Okay. It's, you know, different industries have different types of retirement plans, different types of health benefits. But when people say that more, pe more companies will be dropping their plans, their health care plans, um, I, I just, I don't know what um, facts or empirical data or research will drive anyone to conclude that, in fact, people, companies will drop uh, health insurance because when we hold hearings here, one of the biggest issues that uh, companies and small business bring to us is to find skilled workers. And I'm sure yeah. that in order to retain those skilled workers, if you provide health care as one of the package uh, job offers, that they will be more than willing to come to your company. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. And before Thanks, I yield back, yield. Uh, no balance of my time. Just want to throw out one more statistic today. The ADP National Employment Report, which measures private employment, says small businesses led the way in job creation with 102,000 jobs this uh, November. Thank you.
There's never enough jobs, so I'd like more jobs. Well, uh, let's, we'll pass let's pass the law. Let's We'll cut it down to the wire, but uh, uh, Mr. Schweikert, why don't we uh, uh, let thank, you go? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And having just looked at those um, employment statistics, considering we need to be around three, 350,000 creation every month, um, we're still devastated upside down when you look at our workforce participation. Gentlemen, you? No, our, our workforce participation numbers. I just, because we're up against the clock, um, I'm sure the chairman will hand you some time when we're done. Um, is, is it Bogartis? Am I even close? Bogartis. Bogartis. Um, I, just because I've heard some discussion, you've already explained it twice. I want to try to make you have, ask you to do it again a third time on the aggregation rules, how different these aggregation rules are in regards to what you're seeing in the new health care law compared to what we do uh, have done in the past in pension and tax and mechanics. Can you sort of help uh, under explain some of the um, mechanics and how they're different? Um, I, I, may, I may yield part of this question to Ms. Walker as, uh, as to some of the technical issues. The um, mechanics are different simply because employers have not done this in the past unless they have offered the retirement plan. And in many cases, if they are operating under a safe harbor, they may not have done all of the analysis or they have been able to pull out certain um, business classification units. In terms of, of what we are seeing in actual real life, um, I know there has been discussion of jobs creation and whether employers are hiring or not hiring. I, I would um, caution you on the statistics that you hear and answers to surveys because I know that many of our clients will not answer that question because they have seen the fallout in the industry, uh, whether it is restaurants or other industries, from answering and addressing questions like that. So. I don't believe that you're getting a complete the, picture. The, and then, Mr. Chairman, that one day that might be a completely different hearing because we had that happen once in Arizona where um, some voluntary surveys that were filled out turned out to being, you know, waking up being audited the next day. Um, uh, Ms. Baker, um, now, now with your background in the CPA world, or I could always turn to, back to our lawyer friend, let's deal with the reality of you know, business is trying to survive. We had a hearing yesterday of what many of the small banks are having to do to survive. Have you started to have clients with smart lawyers coming to you saying, how do we have to now game this system? Do we have to put this in a trust? Do we have to hide this, hide that? You don't have to throw anyone under the bus, but have those conversations begun? I think most of the businesses that I deal with, that's the first question they ask me is, um, you know, what do I do to avoid this? So in many ways, one more time as our regulatory command and control society grows out of Washington, we're going to t turn a lot of our friends out there's businesses into trying to find a way to game the law, you know, we're in many ways just to survive. Of course, I advise them not to, but um, that is their first reaction is, what do I have to do to avoid this? Um, Mr. Is it Win Stanley? Um, yes. And now, you have a number. You've actually, if I remember your testimony, some of what you wrote, you've actually reached out and invested um, some of your capital to start other businesses, and yet that may be now pulling you into the business aggregation. Um, does this become sort of a chilling effect on you helping capitalize new economic growth around you? And have you actually been approached on how to game the system? It's, it's one more variable to take into account every time we do something. And we, uh, about gaming the system, of course, you know, the, there's always how do you figure, where do we stand on this? How are, are we set up? so that it's applicable or so it's not applicable. We don't, one, we have to figure it out, which has taken considerable resources, and we, we think we understand it. But, um, you know, I, I, think it's, I think the issue is in the distraction from the business. All right. And, uh, Mr. Chairman, just because we're down to that, you know, about three and a half minutes, um, we actually sort of heard a lot of this in yesterday's hearing, where how do these small banks help economic growth, create jobs, take care of a lot of, you know, our brothers and sisters out there, and the arrogance that we as policymakers keep dumping on to our country and our, our, our job creators, um, at some point we've got to make 
wake up and decide this isn't a partisan. It actually should be about, you know, the people we, you know, represent and not the vanity here of trying to justify things that we've done that don't work. And, Mr. Chairman, with that, I yield back. Uh, thank you. At this point in time, we do have votes, as you can see. Um, so we will adjourn for, I would say, give or take 30 minutes, and uh, after which we will reconvene. So for right now, we will be adjourned. Okay. Uh, Mr. Bentivoglio. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Walker, and thank you, all of you, by the way, for coming in today and testifying. Ms. Walker, is, is, in your practice, you advise small employers, correct? Yes. Yep. Have you found that their situations present difficult issues under the rules, such as complicated family business arrangements, overlapping shareholders? Would you discuss some of these situations, please? Mrs. Uh, Walker? Are you referring to me? Oh, Mrs. I'm sorry, Walker. Right. Mrs. Walker. Um, I, I think one of the best examples is the one that Donna used. Um, and, th and that was an elderly woman who had invested in two restaurants. Um, she invested in a restaurant for her son in one, in one um, state and a restaurant for her nephew in another state. And that required aggregation rules. Um, the other situation was um, a family business where they were making uh, investments. And one of the investments was a golf course. The golf course was not in the same area, and those two businesses then Chair had to be aggregated. Mr. Chairman, don't we need to have the clerk here? Oh, are we missing someone? Uh-oh. Thank you, Ms. Velazquez. I guess we'll pause momentarily. Oh, okay. Uh, we can continue. Go ahead. Still on my time? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Do, um, is it Win, Mr. Wynn Stanley? Win Stanley? Yes, sir. Win Stanley. Thank you. Do you have a tax specialist on your staff? No, not on our staff. Uh, so whom would, would you consult for guidance on the business aggregation rules? We would hire an outside counsel for that. We... we We've attempted to read them ourselves, but we will uh, have to hire somebody outside. Right. And how much, how much is it to hire somebody? <laughs> it ranges, but it's expensive. Very expensive. I mean, a lawyer by the hour, right? Right. Okay. And so it's pretty costly? Would you yes. say uh, $1,000, $2,000? I imagine with the nature of our businesses, it'll be significantly more than that. Yeah. So you're talking 5000 10000 Maybe more. More than that? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, well, um, Mr. Um, or Ms. Bogardis, did I pronounce that right? Yes, sir, Bogardis. Thank you. Most webinars or PowerPoint presentations on the health care law for small businesses do not include materials on the business aggregation rules. Does your company, uh, does your companies? Um, we address the issue. We consistently refer. We're an insurance consulting and brokerage firm. We consistently refer our clients to their uh, tax and legal advisors because it is so complicated. They will have a better understanding of, of any corporations, any business arrangements that they created. It also requires, in many cases, an analysis of options. Uh, family trusts, documents that were created for purposes other than addressing business aggregation. So it can get extremely detailed. Well, how do small businesses know about this aggregation rules and how they affect them? Um, how do they find out about this? You know, quite, quite frankly, uh, their advisor, if they're working with an advisor who mentions it to them, so if they have a an current advisor relationship. advisor that costs more than $10,000. Um, if they have if they have current legal counsel, if they're working with a consultant or a brokerage firm that raises the issue to them, if they read about it on their own, I know there is information posted on the IRS website as well. Now, f forgive me. Are you an attorney? I didn't read. Yes, sir. You're an attorney. So now, it, the way I understand the attorney's charge is they uh, charge by the hour, and that includes research, correct? Yes, sir. So if I had my attorney. Uh, 
what I wanted to know about the health care law, he'd have to read, wow, thousands of pages of regulations, and he would be charging me by the hour to do that? It would, it would not necessarily require the attorney to read the entire Health Reform Act, but it would require analysis and, and quite frankly, experience with the control group rules, which are very specific, very detailed, and that is a very specialized area of the law. So if my attorney, my normal business attorney, doesn't, is unfamiliar with that, I have to go find another attorney, and he's going to charge me, holy cow, okay, thank you. Um, I see my time's pretty much running out. I yield back my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bentivoglio. At this point, we'll yield uh, five minutes to uh, Representative Barber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member, for having this hearing. Is this working? Uh, I appreciate the witness's testimony. It's very helpful to hear directly from individuals who are affected uh, or are trying to help others who are affected by the law. My wife and I ran a small business in our community for 22 years, so we know a little bit what it takes to pay, meet a payroll, keep the doors open, keep customers coming back, and deal with regulations and taxation issues. So. Uh, we're very sympathetic to small businesses on a number of levels. And we also know that the businesses have to stay profitable and they have to find a way to grow. So all of these issues are very important to me. That's why I wanted to be a member of this committee. So I could see, along with my colleagues, what we could do to help small businesses be more successful. And uh, since I've come here um, last year uh, in June, um, I've been trying to partner with people on both sides of the aisle to find reasonable fixes for the Affordable Care Act. I think there are many benefits. We've realized many of them already, individuals and so on. And now uh, we're into the larger implementation uh, with small businesses and individuals. The benefits are real, but the issues are real as well. And I think with any major piece of legislation, over the decades, we've always had to make amendments and revisions to a bill of that size and magnitude. So I'm c clearly interested in learning more about uh, that from you. I mean, clearly, uh, as I look at this, and I've heard your testimony, and when I listen to people back home, small business owners, I'm, I'm, I'm reminded that there are three C's that they often talk about. They talk about the ACA's complexity, that it's confusing, and that it's challenging. And my job as a member of Congress, and I believe that all of our jobs, is to get, th get through all of that and help people be successful and understand the law. So I, I have the same question for each of the witnesses. If you could make one change, or if you could ask one question to be resolved by the agencies that are responsible for the Affordable Care Act, what would your top priority be? Because I think we need to be, have some instruction or some ideas from witnesses about what we can do. I, my colleague, uh, uh, Ms. Hahn, was asking about, let's figure out what to do that's, that makes things better. Uh, we're not just talking about back and forth arguing. Let's talk about what we can do to fix things. What would those things be from each of you, if you could? I'll go first. I, um, I would position the aggregation rule to fulfill the scope that it was originally designed to fulfill, which was promoting the growth of business. I would treat the industries separately uh, within the context of what the industry is and deal with the workforces within the context of what they are to position the law to be viable for all industries. Ms. Baker? It's hard to choose, I imagine, right? It is. It is. I would definitely support, you know, looking at it in the industry by industry, looking at it by control, true control, not just ownership or indirect attributed ownership, you know, someone that is actually making day-to-day -day decisions. And I do think that the 50 employees is too small. It's too small. Thank you. Ms. Bugardis? With respect to the rules that impact small businesses, I would suggest taking a second look at uh, where the rules are with respect to the insurance carriers because there's not the same uh, level of uh, compliance required of them that would support the employer mandate. And uh, I think some of, those, some of those gaps in the law, which make it difficult, if not impossible, for businesses to actually get the coverage, 
uh, would specifically need to be addressed. If I can go off the topic of small businesses, I would say it would be revisiting the definition of minimum essential coverage and the plans that will be offered. And I am sure that some of you have read about them in the Wall Street Journal, the skinny plans. It, there was an article that was about six or eight months ago. Uh, they will not be sufficient coverage, but they will satisfy the employer mandate. And I think when individuals realize that they have coverage, that is not sufficient, but it is what the law required employers to purchase and provide. There will be um, significant backlash, like none of the backlash that we have seen so far to date. Thank you. I take the same approach. We are looking at the insurance product. I think the, the real issue with health care in this country is that the quality of care is not what it needs to be. And this, the, American, the uh, ACA didn't really focus on quality except in a very small segment with some research. So there's a lot more that needs to be done there. And again, I think that the required insurance, the types of insurance, um, it doesn't make it very easy for people to uh, comply with the rules. I want to thank you for your testimony and your good answers, and I yield back. Uh, thank you. At this point, I think uh, Mr. Bentivoglio wanted to have a few uh, add-on questions. So, oh, Mr. Hillscamp, I guess we'll yield to you first. All right, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize for sliding in low late here, and uh, I thank the witnesses for joining us today. And uh, uh, but a couple of questions or a comment at the beginning. I, I think it was Ms. Walker and others had mentioned that uh, the changes you were looking for would take a, a legislative change in order to make that happen. And, and I appreciate that perspective. Uh, but what we have seen with the Affordable Care Act, that's not necessary. Uh, to make the changes from this administration. We've had 10 executive actions by which an employer mandates one of those. Just said, you know what? You've got another year. And I don't know, and, and Ms. Baker, I don't know when people call you, I don't know as a consultant, it makes your job really tough if you don't know what the rules are or they tell you the rules and say they might delay it for another year. And I know that's happened in other arenas, but we have uh, 10 different areas of uh, the Affordable Care Mandate, which is the law of the land where the administration has, by executive action, said, you know what, we're not going to make employers uh, do the reporting requirements. How do you handle that? How do you answer that question when the IRS hasn't finalized rules on this and uh, they could change the rules? I, I, I'll give you one example. I had a, a business in Salina, Kansas. They uh, were noted in the local paper on July 1st they made their changes. That was the renewal period, and they did everything they had to do. What a mistake. On July 2nd, the President said, just kidding. We are going to suspend that part for another year or delay the mandate and those kind of things. I mean, what is the answer you give to the folks that definitely must be calling in? Says, well, what does a one-year delay mean? And I will answer, ask that question, Ms. Baker, first. It does make it very, very difficult, especially for a small firm like mine, because you know we have such limited resources. So, you know, you take the initiative to communicate everything, and then all of a sudden it changes. And so you reach out and have to re-communicate. You know, so the amount of time and the expense associated with that is is great. Other responses from the, the panel? Sure. It just it consumes a phenomenal amount of energy that that's not that's not uh, used on something else constructive. And for, fortunately, for the restaurant side of our business, it's uh, we're we're looking at it saying this just isn't sustainable with our current business model. So something's got to be done before this gets rolled out so we can feel some level of comfort that something will happen. Uh, hopefully yeah. that's not a pipe dream. <laughs> well, and uh, we, I, I have yet seen anything from the White House that they want to make any changes legislatively to this act. I mean, there have been many suggestions uh, of things we could fix. We have heard them here, heard them multiple uh, times in this committee. Uh, we mentioned the SBA and as a uh, representative administration, and no interest in changing one letter of the law unless it is by executive action. And that is uh, certainly uh, unacceptable to me. Uh, one thing I would like to ask Ms. Walker on another issue as far as uh, the, uh, the trend of uh, basically a part time economy. Uh, the, the new hires, according to the Department of Labor, I didn't know they were that bad. That in this economy, four out of five new jobs was that the figure that you had that are created are part time. The uh, for every one full time job that's created, it's four part time jobs created. Okay. Okay. Well, so when you average the hours, that's not quite four to one. Okay, right. That but makes it's, sense. Yes. So four out of five new and jobs. And that the thing that was surprised. Well, that's surprising in and of itself to me. But the 
the trend, and I'm not sure whether it was 2010 to 2012 or what the years were, but mm-hmm. the trend is it's flipped. It used to be six full times to one part time yeah. versus one to four. That, that is uh, really a devastating figure. I mean, it's not devastating for us in this room, uh, definitely. It's, it's the, the folks out there looking for a job, particularly young people, mm-hmm. which had been the most devastated in this lack of a uh, long-term ep- economic recovery. And uh, can you describe a little more what happens in, in basically this part-time economy, you know, where you're, you're trying to work around, trying to avoid these mandates? Uh, yeah, I mean, people might say, well, why aren't you p- providing health insurance for somebody who works 20 hours a week? Uh, there are reasons. It's costly. Right. It's costly. And, and trying to make those demands in a changing, uncertain environment where you, you, you got to look and say, well, I, you can't work this much this weekend. And the reality is it's not just figures. I've heard from my district story after story of small business owners saying, you know, Congressman, I didn't hire anybody this week. I'm not going to hire anybody next year because I'm worried about the threshold. Mm-hmm. I'm, I, I don't know what the rules are going to be. I'm not going to take that risk. And, and these are uh, successful businessmen and women. And, but the message we're sending from Washington is, is that uh, you know, we'll, we'll let you know next year. And it doesn't work that way. Uh, any further comments from you all? I know I'm about out of time on that, but that's the frustration I'm hearing, which is matching uh, what, what the panel has. Ms. Bogartis? I would just add, thank you. Uh, I would just add that it, it's an issue that's crying out for leadership. And leadership in terms of uh, what you're doing here today, and that is seeking out the truth. What is the truth? What are the facts? And then coming to at least some sort of agreement on what you can agree on. I mean, the American people, the small business owners, the large business owners, they want to see some sort of a solution to these problems other than um, the issues being raised and the, the lack of a solution just being acceptable or considered inevitable. And we, we need somebody to, uh, and, and a group of people, perhaps to step up and say, some, something's got to change because we can't sit back and watch the train go down the tracks with the bolts flying off because we know what's going to happen. And this is our, our country, our economy, our fellow citizens, the children, the young people who are trying to get jobs, people who are trying to grow a business, business owners who are trying to do planning, who are putting off expansion, putting off buildings, putting off all kinds of things that could create and generate other jobs, not just within their own businesses, construction work and other things. So it's, it's crying out for leadership. And I would say um, this is a great start, and I would continue down that path. Yeah. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Oh, yes, thank you, Ms. Bogardis. That was a great summary, actually. Uh, at this point, I'd like to yield five minutes uh, to Mr. Payne. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Payne, will you yield for one second? Yes. Okay. I just, if you, if you, no. if not. Um, it's, it's, you're the ranking member, my, please. Go ahead and use your five minutes. I will come back. It no, just, please. I didn't want to lose the, the, the train here. Ma'am. Uh, Ms. Walker, you mentioned it just that it struck me that that number that one out of five uh, uh, jobs are part time jobs. What was the number that you? Uh, uh-huh. For every one full time job created, there's four part time jobs created. Yeah. And we had a hearing that I mentioned before, and we have the expert witness, Dean Baker. Who, from the Center for Economic and Policy Research. And he said the vast majority of people who work part-time do so voluntarily. In many cases, they have family or other obligations that make part-time employment desirable. Even with the current weak labor market, more than two-thirds of the people who work part-time report that they do so voluntarily. Thank you for yielding. Thank you. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> you know... Uh, it's just an observation, uh, and, uh, you know, the Affordable Health Care uh, Act is a law, uh, very new in its infancy, and naturally there are going to be issues around the implementation. Uh, we know the problems that we've had to this point, but the meat of the, the act, I think, will revolutionize health care in this nation. And, you know, if we look back at other large um, programs that have been implemented over the course of time, um, one being Social Security is probably the easiest one to to mention. Uh, when it was implemented, it was going to destroy this nation, and uh, we were going to socialism, and 
how could we do this? It was going to ruin the nation. And I think most Americans now think that Social Security is part of the fabric of this country. And so I see the Affordable Care Act having the same type of um, uh, uh, life in this nation. Um, you know, when they started Social Security, they used uh, your name as your identifier. Well, guess what? They had to tweak the system because there were a lot of Donald Paynes and Miss Bakers and what have you. So they went to the Social Security number. So nothing is perfect when it starts. You have to let it evolve into something that's going to work. So I like to use that example because it's probably the easiest example to use in terms of rough starts for large programs that uh, are successful over the course of time. And Ms. Baker, in your um, testimony, uh, you state that this law leads small business owners to provide health coverage in an industry where that is not the norm. Well, let me just say that, you know, I want to say that upsetting the norm is precisely what the Affordable Care Act is about. Over the last decade, health insurance premiums for small firms have increased 113 percent, leading to dropped coverage. The Affordable Care Act was enacted to upset this norm and make it easier for small businesses to compete and offer quality benefits. The norm prior to the law allowed insurance companies to drop coverage for employers, for employees when they needed coverage the most and discriminate against people with pre-existing conditions. The law upsets this norm. Prior to the Affordable Care Act, it was normal for an average U.S. family and their employer to pay an additional $1,000 for uninsured people to cover that cost. The Affordable Care Act aims to upset this norm by bringing the uninsured into the system, driving overall costs down. Now, there are issues with the law that need to be tweaked, but the bones and the substance of the law are good, and they're here to stay. Further, 96% of U.S. businesses have fewer than 50 employees, and according to the last census data, less than 1% of businesses have between 45 and 49 employees, placing them at risk of falling into the abyss of the employer mandate. Again, that is less than 1%. Now, I'm interested in addressing valid concerns about the Affordable Care Act, and you've stated many today, such as the compliance and the burden on small businesses. However, I really find it non-constructive to continue to play on the fears of the American people rather than work on ways to make this law better and see it implemented successfully. So, uh, you know, over the course of the last two days, I've heard the president uh, speaking before groups and saying, if you have ideas, and I believe he's reaching out to our colleagues on the other side, if you have ideas that will strengthen the law, then let's discuss it. But to continue to try to tear it down and sabotage it and not even allow it to go through its natural courses is, is, is counterproductive. So, um, you know, in terms of solutions, and I'm, I'm, I'm very open to the criticism and the potential of making it stronger. So I, 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 I'm glad to hear your testimony. Uh, Mr. Winstonley, uh, you mentioned, yes, sir. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. Did I pronounce it correctly? Yes, that's Win, Win Stanley, yes. Win Stanley, I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, you mentioned an eFlex coalition that advocates for greater flexibility and options within the law. I understand that the restaurant industry has a unique makeup. What proposal does the coalition have to provide flexible flexibility while holding, upholding the law's goal of expanding insurance coverage for all? Uh, I don't, in my, where do you see the E-Flex? Uh, okay. Oh, it was referenced in the regulations? Yeah. Um, I'm not familiar enough with that. That was in the, the regular. I'm not familiar enough with that to speak to that. What I what I would like to speak to, though, is uh, you mentioned Social Security. And to my generation and every generation, 
behind us what Social Security is known for as being a completely unsustainable program. I'd also like to mention that we, uh, we uh, when I got started, I got started with a 24-hour diner that had about 10 or 12 employees, my twin brother, and we stayed up all night building that place and rebuilding it and turning it into a real business, and there was nothing we wanted more than to build our business and add to it. And I've been fortunate to have some very good advice from people over the years that have done similar things, and, and what they've shared with me time and again is that, which turned out to be true in our case, is that every next step you take is harder than the step behind you, and there's a uh, significant growth burden that comes with trying to build a real business. Uh, and the 50, the 50, the 50 employees... Uh, regardless of what industry I believe you're in, the 50 employees presents an additional significant hurdle for people who are trying to build something meaningful. And I think it's counter to the spirit of this country. Uh, thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Bentivoglio wanted to ask a uh, follow-on question. So, Mr. Bentivoglio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a few, a few short questions. Mr. Winstanley? Yes, sir. The health care law requires you to inform your employees about the health insurance choices available to them. Is this an additional burden and expense for your country or companies? Sorry, it requires us to inform them about the health care. Right. Well, yes, yes, sir. There's a significant amount of education that goes on, and it's, uh, as anybody with kids knows, it might be, it's, it's hard to educate somebody who's not interested to hear what you're saying. Um, the, uh, you know, it's traditionally been very challenging for us to educate to the to the groups of people that we were able to provide health insurance to. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I, I see that as being a very significant, yes, sir, I see that as being a very significant challenge. No, well, I was back in the district last weekend. I had dinner at a restaurant, and the waitress came over, and she recognized me and um, a big supporter and uh, told me her story that she lost her job, now is working two jobs, all because of the health care. She had lost it when they found out about this employer mandate before they delayed that, right? And they had to reduce their employees. And now she's working two jobs. Do you have a lot of waitresses or people on your staff that are working two jobs to make ends meet? We have a significant number of people doing that. And we have, what, we, what we've seen is there are a lot of people who need part-time jobs, and that's because wage and job growth in permanent full-time positions hasn't been there while the cost of child care and housing continue to increase. You think that's largely attributed to the unaffordable, excuse me, affordable? It's really confusing. Unaffordable Health Care Act? I got it right. <laughs> I, I think that it's, a, it wrong. I think it, I think it's attributable to a general slowdown, which the Health Care Act is, is very much influencing. Great. So let's see. Um, uh, Ms. Baker, under the aggregate rules, a controlled group is a collection of two or more corporations with common stock ownership that are connected in one of several ways. Many small businesses don't issue stock. How would the rules be applied in those cases? Ms. Baker, CPA, right? Yes. They look at um, ownership. So, you know, if you're, if you're not a corporation, they look at investment um, and equity within those companies. So in my example, when I invested in a small woman's boutique just as an investment, I don't, own, I don't manage or operate that on a day-to-day -day basis. Those employees are then pulled into my CPA firm as part of the rules of aggregation. And In increasing costs. And increasing the cost. And even though, you know, um, Mr. Payne mentioned that the norm, you know, I, I think the norm is we'd all love to provide health insurance in every industry. But, you know, that's a very small woman's boutique. There's very few other women's boutique that would have to require health insurance because they're small businesses and they're not meeting the 50 employees. So for me to have to provide health insurance for them makes me not competitive in that market just because I'm an entrepreneurial and own businesses in, in different industries. Okay, so let's see if we can sum up uh, higher deductibles, higher premiums, um, additional legal costs, correct? tens of thousands of dollars for a small business and and you're less competitive thank you very much <laughs> thank you I mr bentvolio uh, at this point uh, we will uh, call the hearing uh, to a close i want to thank all of our witnesses for being here today it's very timely um, i think what some people do forget is even though the employer mandate uh, the penalty portion has been delayed a year the uh, calculations as to whether or or not you will have to comply start in three weeks time 
So on January 1st, that's the first uh, beginning of what will be 12 monthly buckets of keeping track of the hours and the employees to see if you hit the 50 FTEs or not. So it is a very timely uh, situation. Uh, we, we certainly hear, heard a lot of give and take. I think uh, uh, we all recognize is that there d will be changes that will be needed uh, in this law, and uh, hopefully now uh, the president would, would agree to make some changes. He has not uh, up till this point in time uh, recognize that, but I think an overwhelming number of Americans today are expressing displeasure in the law. Uh, and certainly, as we heard today, compliance with the law and the application of the complex aggregation rules is uh, burdensome and is confusing for business. And I think uh, it almost goes without saying that uh, a big government, one size fits all set of regulations and laws that tell a business what benefits they have to offer, whether that's a restaurant, a construction company, or a high-tech manufacturing company, is, in fact, a drag on the economy. Uh, today's hearing did highlight another example of the unintended consequences of the Affordable Care Act, namely the high cost to business of hiring a CPA or other tax advisor to give advice on the IRS aggregation rules, money that is better spent on growth in the creation of jobs. Uh, we on this committee will continue to closely follow the implementation of this law and its effect on small business. I would ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, before we close, I just would like to thank all the witnesses. And it's kind of a breath of fresh air to hear uh, that we're talking now about uh, fixing and, uh, and, and look at ways where we could improve the implementation of health care. So it's great to know, uh, finally, that we are moving beyond repealing Obamacare to uh, finding common ground to make it work, because it's the law of the land. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member uh, Velazquez. And with that, without objection, uh, this hearing is now adjourned.